Hey everyone and welcome to episode 2 of Front Suspension Geometry where on this episode I'm going to show you everything you need to know about camber and how it relates to your setup. With camber it's a relatively well understood kinematic of suspension where everybody knows that from looking at the front of the car the camber is the angle of the wheel in relation to the vehicle's vertical axis. So if we're going to imagine that this is our vehicle and this is zero degrees and this is our wheel, we are going to measure our wheel from the front plane and see what it's at. So in this instance, the way that the jig is set up right now, we're sitting at around minus five, minus six degrees of camber. And if I was to adjust it the opposite, that would be changing it to a positive camber setup, okay? And then the next point now that I just adjusted this is to show you where you can adjust your camber from. On a McPherson strut, a lot of times you can get some camber adjustment out of the wheel itself. This is what I would call a static camber adjustment where it doesn't have anything to do with your KPI setup or your caster setup. It is specifically right at the wheel. This is typically a very minor adjustment with a short slot that's in the coilover designed in a way that is already meant to work with the settings of the car that it's on. So. Tightening those back up, the next spot that we can adjust our camber from is commonly adjusted from the lower control arm. You can either, if you've got modified knuckles, you're more than likely to extend the control arm and weld in an extension piece, let's say from 25 millimeters to 50 millimeters. If you've got a BMW, an S chassis, Mustangs, whatever, it's pretty common to do a budget angle kit and lengthen your suspension from the lower control arm. And doing that, is easy but what people don't realize is when you're lengthening your lower control arm from the bottom you are changing more than just camber you are significantly increasing your kingpin inclination or kpi as i'm going to refer to it throughout the rest of this video your kpi is increasing linear with the length that you are adjusting your lower control arm so whenever you do adjust your lower control arm or you have an angle kit that is lengthening the lower control arm like all of our kits do, you need to make an adjustment to the upper portion of the strut, which is typically where your camber plate is. And up here, if you went 40 millimeters down here, if you want to maintain the factory kingpin inclination angle, you would also need to increase the upper mount by 40 millimeters. This way you are maintaining the factory KPI setting. Now, if you're using a kit that has, let's say, 75 millimeters of length extended on the lower control arm, you are probably not going to be able to get that from your upper strut mount. The reason is because to, to maintain legality within the FD rule books, you cannot lengthen the upper strut outside of its bolt circle. We talked about this in the last video with Caster. So with that knowing when you're doing this and you're running a kit that's 75 millimeters longer and that you could only go 50 millimeters wider at the top you need to understand that what you're doing is increasing the kpi of the factory suspension you are probably going to be going two to three degrees over what the factory suspension originally was this doesn't necessarily mean it's bad but it may not handle the way that it should so with that, let's go through a couple scenarios where we get rid of the caster, maybe even get rid of the KPI and go through a sweep and see what happens when we adjust our camber at the wheel and what happens when we adjust our camber at the top and what it's gonna do to your wheel at full lock. The reason why we check our alignment settings at full lock is because when we're at full lock, that's primarily where we're doing the majority of our driving while drifting. And the amount of contact that we're getting on this tire and the type of contact is really important with how the car is going to behave while drifting and how much grip you're going to have, how much it may scrub, and so on. So with that, let's get into moving around some stuff with this jig. What I've really noticed with this jig is you get to visually see so many things that you could not replicate on a stock car. So you guys might be surprised at what's going to happen because I've already played with it a little bit, but uh, we're going to show you. So what we're going to do with this setup is we're going to increase our camber value using the lower control arm and then we're going to increase our camber value using only the wheel. The variable here is that our KPI is going to change when we use the lower control arm versus when we use the knuckle. And with this you're going to see what the difference is at full lock between the two options. 
And then for yourself, you're going to be able to decide when you're buying a kit and what's happening with the kit, what you're going to end up with at full lock. This is the prime example of you and your buddy having the same caster, camber and tow settings, but the two cars handle differently. Maybe John got his camber from the lower control arm and Steve got his camber from the knuckle. They're going to have a different angle at full lock and a different contact patch at full lock and the car is actually going to behave quite a bit differently because of this KPI angle. And if I'm just going to show you the KPI angle with a straight line, when we go into KPI as an individual video, we're going to really go in depth with how it works. But for this, if I'm just to draw a straight line using this front edge of the tape, you can see it needs to pass through the upper and the lower ball joint. So right now I'm running a relatively low KPI angle and you can see by following the edge of the tape on this side that this is how the line would look. Okay, so this is important to note when we're doing these changes by lengthening the control arm. Just for a quick visual, let's lengthen this out and then you can easily see if I pass this through, the KPI angle has already increased, okay? So this is gonna be the difference between the two setups when we measure our camber angle static and then when we measure it at full lock. Okay, so with this setup, we're just gonna run with the numbers that we have as I've lengthened the lower control arm. Uh, currently we have negative eight degrees on our camber. We have five degrees on our caster. And to get a rough idea of what our KPI is, even though this is going to be the variable that's changing, our rough KPI angle is 14 degrees. So we have 14 degrees through our two, through our two ball joints giving us our kingpin inclination axis. That is the axis that this whole setup rotates on. And we know that this was at negative eight degrees, so let's turn the wheel to full lock and measure what we're at. This is actually a positive five degree angle on our wheel at full lock. So if maybe we'll find a picture example online where we can see a lot of cars that have a positive wheel on their lead, really, really common. Cars that have high KPI and high caster values like BMWs are going to have a wheel flop or a lot of positive camber on this lead wheel. And then cars that have lower values or that have a reverse engineered kit are gonna show something different. They're gonna show a much flatter contact patch on the lead wheel. And checking the opposite effect on the trail wheel, we're getting an angle of six degrees of negative camber. So with our static at negative eight, we're getting positive five degrees of camber on the lead, negative six degrees of camber on the trail. Keep this in mind because when we change up the camber that we're getting, from using the lower control arm to just using the knuckle, those numbers will be different. Okay, so we now have negative eight degrees of camber using the knuckle adjustment. Um, this, this is all fairly exaggerated. You typically wouldn't have this range um, at the knuckle, but this is also going into whatever the factory setup is on the chassis that I am able to replicate it with this jig. So although I have a lot of adjustment range on this knuckle, it doesn't necessarily mean that the car wouldn't already be set up in this manner. Um, and then showing you what happens when we use the lower control arm. So here we are at uh, negative eight. Let's go to the lead and we will measure the difference here. And this is about as drastic as you can make it. We have a 90 degree wheel at full lock. It's saying 89.9, which with this level, I mean, you're plus or minus 0.5 probably. So this is exactly 90 degrees. And we're gonna do the opposite and go to the trail. And we're sitting at negative 10. And let's get our KPI angle. I believe it was 14 degrees when we did our first set. And we're going to get an approximate KPI angle here. And we're sitting at eight degrees. Our kingpin inclination is at eight degrees. So we went from 14 to eight and we made our camber adjustment at the knuckle versus with the lower. Two very drastic different numbers. So 
This is again an exaggeration, but I can't express it enough. When you adjust things different ways, you're going to get different results. So when somebody's complaining about their wheel flop or how it performs differently, this is exactly why. Um, and then I'm going to leave, I will give you what my opinion is on how I've set up my car and how we set up our angle kits, but this is always up to discretion because as I said before, in different countries, there are different styles of driving. Some drivers, like let's use Japanese style for example, they prefer a lot more scrub in the front. They like to throw a lot of hard angle and that's totally fine. The style is way more driver oriented and driver skill than it is mechanical setup. So when, when you talk about American drifting and how we want to have everything mechanically perfect, um, this, is, this is assuming that the variable, the variation between drivers is so minute that we're trying to get a performance advantage using our setup. So ideally you want to have your contact patch as flat as possible on your lead wheel because the majority of the weight of your car is on the lead wheel. You'll often see in competitive drifting that the trail wheel is either floating or very close to floating and it's completely unloaded. Um, it's really easy to see, especially on bank tracks when these cars are left foot braking and you just see the smoke piling off of that trail wheel. It's because there's very little weight on the trail wheel. The majority of the vehicle's weight is on the lead wheel. The lead wheel is doing almost all of the steering and you've got 900 wheel horsepower pushing behind it and you're trying to steer it with this lead wheel. So you want as much tire contact patch as you can possibly get in order to control that car. So that's why I would suggest that ideally you want to reduce the amount of camber gain um, throughout your suspension's travel range. And this is where we start to implement things like trail in the knuckle where we're allowed to reduce the caster but still maintain a self-steering effect and all sorts of cool stuff. So in closing, Camber has a lot of things to talk about when we're discussing grip driving. We could probably go on for hours displaying how that benefits in this jig. We would be focusing on is actually that under compression, we would see that Camber is actually gained, which would indicate going around a, going around a corner. Um, this, this is kind of a bad setup because our KPI is super low, but going around a corner and grip driving as the suspension compresses, you want to be gaining camber. To counteract the slip angle of the tire, we want to gain camber so that while the body rolls, we're increasing the contact patch of the tire and um, increasing the level of grip that the tire is able to provide. Basically, camber is relatively simple. The complicated part is showing you that you can get camber through three different methods of adjustment and understanding that is super important when it comes to drifting. So I think that we've demonstrated that extremely well with this. So to close on camber, there is no perfect or right way to do it when it comes to drifting. When it comes to grip driving, there is a perfect and there is a right way to do it. So with drifting, there's so many variations with tire compound and rear setup, car's weight balance, weight distribution, slip angle of the tires. The tires are wearing down, so they're constantly changing in their grip level as the temperature goes up and the tread wear goes down. There's so many variables with drifting that can be taken into consideration. I am just showing you what is going on when you're doing what. And with camber, that's it. This is all we need to go over for camber. Check us out on our next video, episode three, which is going to be on tow. Tow, again, is a relatively basic situation, and I'm kind of thinking that I should incorporate tow with Ackerman and throw those two together, but we'll see if I can make enough of a discussion to do with uh, tow setup and using this jig because then we're going on a roll center and then we're getting into the really fun stuff in my opinion. So we've covered our very basic setups that everyone talks about and even though this is the information that everybody tells everybody else, like when you ask somebody for an alignment specs, you're giving them your caster camber toe, there that doesn't tell all the stories. That does not say that if somebody has the same values, it's not going to perform the same, especially if the chassis are different. If somebody has a BMW and the other guy has an S13, there is zero correlation between those two chassis. One is a front rack, one is a rear rack, and so on. The KPI angles are different, the caster's different. The mounting points of the suspension, believe it or not, play a major role in whether the arm is pitched or not. This is gonna affect your roll pitch whenever you're braking and accelerating, how the car is gonna behave with a double wishbone. Oh my goodness, you could go on forever, how different everything is. But we will go into double wishbone. Double wishbone is going to be similar uh, traits and idea and different methods of going about getting that setting. So with that, see us on the next episode, episode three, which is going to be tow and 
yeah, we're just going to continue having fun with this jig and, and playing around with it and showing you what's happening with your car. Uh, don't fall. <laughs> so subscribe to our channel on YouTube if you want to keep in touch. Um, don't forget to comment on the video, whatever you think. And if you're learning anything, that's awesome. Like this is the point of the video. It is not to push our brand or say that we're better than anybody else. The point of the video is to show you and help you understand what you're doing. Pretty much, that's all I'm here to do, is uh, I want everybody to know what's up. So subscribe to us, follow us on social media, and uh, like the video, comment, do all that kind of stuff, because it helps us out and it uh, keeps us going. So see you on episode three, so, over and out. Okay, you can just splice that, yeah.